So when I started university, um, I had this lecture on Elizabeth I. And uh, the lecturer was talking about how women rule for 44 years on our own. And I just thought, oh my God, during the 16th century, we had a woman making decisions in power without a man. And uh, then I was just, I, I think I can even say I just fell in love. Um, I went to buy my first book and then I read so much about her, about her um, political abilities, about her background as well, what happened with her mother, with her father, uh, what happened with Thomas Seymour when she was a teenager. Um, and I kind of sometimes related to her, so I just felt like this kind of closeness and I felt like drawn to her. So I decided to, yeah, that I would become like a historian and an expert, obviously, um, on her. So, yeah, that is, I think that the, m the most fascinating aspect of Elizabeth is that, yes, she had counsel, you know, she has private counsellors and she received counsel and she listened to them, but she was very much in charge. She really, really was. And you can see, like, throughout her reign, the way she made decisions. I mean, in 1566, she told her parliament that she was the head and that they were the feet and that it would be monstrous that the feet should direct the head. And a woman could not be a head during the 16th century. It was not possible, but she was. And so in so many ways, I feel like she was an extraordinary woman because she was not queen of England, she was king of England. And that is why I just, yeah, I just love working on her. Anne Boleyn was very, very smart. I think she was very ambitious. I'm not, I'm not gonna deny that. She obviously had ambitions. Um, and I think that, especially, you know, as we, we portray her, you know, for example, in the Tudors, the TV show, um, she this kind of, sometimes she's seen even as a, so we have the idea of a witch, to not to say a whore, but, and we have this idea of a very seductive, um, manipulative, um, very ambitious, but ambitious with, a, with this idea that it's not something good. You should not want to be queen, why not? Uh, you know, but me, the way I remember Anne Boleyn is the mother to Elizabeth. I think she was a great mother. I think she was loving. I think she was caring. And again, this is how we, we portray her. And, I, and so it's not just about this witch, you know, who tried to seize the power, but I think she really loved Henry. And I think she was so happy to have this daughter and wanted to have a, you know, more children from Henry and more love, but she felt like this pressure and she felt like a failure for giving him a daughter instead of a son that she promised, obviously. Um, and that in, just if she realized the pressure, I'm sure she would have been completely fine and they would have had like many children and he, and it's, and it's just, you can see how a man can, like, mistreat a woman for not giving him what he exactly wants. But when you think about Anne Boleyn, an amazing, amazing mother, she re and um, she, I, I believe that she really wanted the best for her daughter. Uh, and in my opinion, obviously, I, I, I've, I've always felt like, well, she's the one who gave the for me by far the best monarch that has ever reigned in the end she produced the best monarch and i'm saying monarch not queen because of the issue i just talked about that has ever reigned and she paid the price of her life for that so i just feel like in the end it i'm really interested the, the the pressure for women to to be mother the pressure to have sons instead of daughters, but she also represents like a caring mother and uh, she feels so human as well, you know, in, in terms of like feeling she had for Henry and then the love for her daughter and then her fall and uh, this is how I see her really. I don't see her as a witch. If you really look at how Elizabeth 
ruled our country, but remained our own free women throughout our reign. You see that, yes, she had counselors, but in the end, she was very much in charge. She never married. She also um, dismissed her parliament in 1567. So it's, she shows that she was really much in charge. And so I feel like when I say greatest monarch, it's for various reasons. It's for an act of uniformity, you know, to make sure that she was going to find a way for Protestants and Catholics to live together. That's something that French kings were failing to do. Then the act of supremacy. She should have been supreme head of the church. She was smart enough to change the title to supreme governor. But at the same time, using this idea of being the head when talking to a parliament. And then you just have to look at her speeches and the way she defied strong powers in Europe, Spain and France, how she managed to make believe the friend that she was going to marry one of them, one of the few, few kings that uh, were uh, there at that time, because there were a succession of them, they kept dying after one another. And she, for like hmm, 15 years, she played. Yes, I will marry you. No, I won't. Yes, we can know. And that just helped her S maintaining good relations with France, making sure they were not going to invade her, helping the Huguenots and the Protestants in the Spanish Netherlands. So she was an astute politician above all. And this in all this way, when you take all these things, it makes her like it really makes her the best monarch, greatest monarch ever. And also, I feel like she truly, truly cared about her realm and her people. I'm not saying, I'm not talking about her personality, was she sometimes mean, was she, you know, like we have historians talking about that, that she could slap one of her, you know, ladies in, like, in waiting. I mean, it's something else. It's, we all have our personalities. In the end, it's how she ruled. She was doing progresses in her realm. She was visiting them, she was showing herself, and she played this kind of like, she was kind of like a rock star for the 16th century when you think about it. Going on progresses, showing her portraits. We have this propaganda behind her as well, played with Cecil, Walsingham and, and uh, Leicester, but it was also her. Those beautiful portraits of her, playing like this magnificent queen. And even when you look at the portraits, you see that, especially the Armada portrait in 1588, she looks like a king, come on, she has arms like so big, she has her hands on the globe and she is in charge. She just won against Spanish. How amazing was that? She exchanged letters with uh, the Chinese emperor, with the Ottoman emperor. Uh, you have the work of, um, what's her name? Rain Allinson, uh, who worked on that. Uh, or Anya Riel Bertolé as well, uh, with the Tsar of Russia. She was very, very much aware of her role. Even if she was ruling only, like, because let's face it, I don't want to, you know, to offend anyone, but England was tiny uh, compared to the rest of the world. And she was very much aware of how to make it great through herself. And because she was so well educated, because she was smart, because she didn't want to be controlled by men. She managed to have her own diplomatic relations and she shaped them the way she wanted it.